My name is Alex Dorgen. I'm an Ansible Solution Specialist. And today I'm going to be talking about setting up an Ansible development server, including setting up Ansible Navigator as well as a VS Code server so it can have a full development environment as I look to get started with Ansible. So why did I mention Ansible Navigator and not just using the Ansible Playbook command line tool? So for me, I specifically want to leverage execution environments. This means everything that I'm developing can be portable, so I can move that execution environment between the development environments I'm leveraging today, as well as the production environments tomorrow that I'm leveraging inside the automation platform. It also means I already have everything baked into that execution environment. So I've already got the Ansible core version that I want to leverage, whether that's 2.12, 2.13, or 2.14. It also has the desired collections that I need, so I can leverage Ansible Builder, which I've talked about in another video. And then I can also have all the necessary Python dependencies and bind up dependencies already included in that execution environment. So I don't have to worry about updating Python and the actual system itself or trying to set up Python virtual environments. I can just leverage that execution environment to maintain everything that I need. So I don't need to set up a lot on that virtual machine. I can just set up Podman or Docker, then pip, and then Ansible Navigator itself. I'm also going to do some additional work in this walkthrough to set up a VS Code server on that server so I can have everything self-contained on a single virtual machine. If I am leveraging a Mac or a Windows server, I will have to do additional work because there are some additional tools that you have to install, so WSL for Windows or setting up some homebrew tools for Mac in order to set all this up, but it is not a difficult process to get this off the ground. So if you haven't looked at an execution environment or curious what it is, Again, this is a fully baked way to have automation in a very portable fashion. So instead of needing to set up a separate server and creating all these execution environments at other points, I can just push to a container registry, pull it down when I need to on the correct server, and I'm off and running. So every time I want to set up an Ansible server, I have much less work to do since I don't have to figure out all the additional Python libraries and dependencies that I need for those particular collections or playbooks. I can just pull down that execution environment and be off and running. And I'll show that as I go through this to leverage some of my execution environments that I've built. So if you're not familiar with Ansible Navigator, it's the new command line tool that helps you run playbooks inside execution environments. So something as simple as Ansible Navigator run and then the playbook name will run that playbook inside the new text user interface. You don't have to run it in the text user interface. I can leverage the usual standard out but it also lets me do some basic things of you know, seeing what the inventory is, seeing the documentation, the configurations, or you know, I can dive a little bit deeper and see the actual collections inside the execution environment that I'm leveraging. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to see exactly what my environment looks like without needing to dive into the really deep ideas inside the file systems and trying to figure out what collections do I have, what versions of them do I have. I can just jump into Ansible Navigator and see those collections. So this is why I would recommend if I'm setting up a development environment to leverage Ansible Navigator so I can know exactly what I'm developing against as I'm going through this process. So now I want to go through and actually leverage, in my case, a RHEL 8 server and build out all of the tools to have a development server up and running. So I have a fresh RHEL 8 server that I've stood up. It's actually running RHEL 8.6 currently. Obviously, this can be really any Linux variant that you want. Um, but I'm going to go through the process first of standing up that VS Code server. So I'm actually pulling it directly from um, GitHub. So there's actually a script that they've created to help with this process. So I'm actually going to just run that script as we go through this. And this will go through the process of pulling down the particular package and then installing the RPM. Very simple script um, as it goes through that process. And then I can actually enable that so that VS Code server will be available. Personally, I like to set things up to be a little bit more usable for me in the future. So I'm actually going to go through the process of you know, doing that enable, but then I'm going to change the particular target that it creates so that it um, actually doesn't require authorization. I don't really want users to have to put in a password as they go through that process. So I'm actually going to change um, basically the code server login itself. And instead of it just being code server, I can add in a little uh, end bit that will do off none, so I don't have to worry about it trying to actually request an authorization when a user logs in. I don't really need that because, again, I want to make this as usable as possible. So I'm going to reload the daemon and then restart that code server. So now I've got everything up and running. Personally, I don't want to have to go to port 8080, which is what it sets up. I actually want to leverage a proxy to have 443 and be able to use uh, SSL certs. 
So I'm actually going to install Nginx and make sure all that's up and running. And then because I do have firewall D running, I am going to go through the process of, you know, setting up HTTPS to be a permanent rule, reload firewall, uh, and then actually update my nginx.config to include the certs that I've already copied over onto this server. So I've streamlined a lot of this process to make it a little bit easier. Um, but again, this is just for me to have SSL certs because I personally don't, don't want to have to deal with uh, not having certs. So I'm going to go through and you know set up those nginx certs. And conveniently, I can just copy and paste my additional configuration uh, against it. So again, this will set up the specific certs that I've already provided uh, to my server. So they're conveniently named uh, based on my Shadow Man development environment. But now this gives me that capability. And then I can just actually run Nginx. Helps if I actually spell it correctly. And now I'm off and running. So Nginx is actually running on this server and it will be pointing to um, my particular environment. I do wanna start getting Podman set up because that will also be kind of a key aspect for what I'm doing. So as this is going on, I'm gonna install Podman. And then there are some things that you may run into with Podman if you're not used to leveraging uh, rootless containers. If you don't have your user IDs set up properly, you may run into an issue where it says, you know, this namespace doesn't have authorization as you try into try to pull in containers. I personally found this out myself. I admit I did not know about it. Dug deep into it and I'll include in the um, description at the bottom kind of what that rootless container ID is and how you can verify the two particular files that I'll update. You can set up your server so they'll automatically update the sub UID and sub GID as part of adding in new users, but I'm gonna do this manually in case you've never seen this before and are not sure what I'm talking about, just so you have that capability ready to go. But once uh, Podman is complete, I will go through that process of editing those two files. Again, I'm basically just adding in my username, a Dorjan, and then basically starting from a the next available file number and then giving it a you know certain range to populate into. So I'm just gonna leverage the default that's part of this, but. I'll run into that process and you'll notice there's already one here. I'm going to go in and add myself at that next available number and then save that. And I'll do the same thing for the GID. And then it does require you to basically run Podman system migrate to make sure that is actually in effect. So now I've got Podman set up appropriately for me to be able to do everything I want as my particular user. Now I'm actually going to install pip3 if I haven't already. Conveniently, this server does have it installed, so we'll just say that it's already there. And then I will leverage pip to actually go through the process of setting up Ansible Navigator through the Python packages. I'm leveraging Python uh, to install it rather than leveraging the RPM. So Red Hat does provide RPMs if you have the Ansible Automation Platform subscription. I'm assuming you're just leveraging a development server or some sort of Linux server that you may not have access to those repositories. So I'm doing this setup without that. I'll put the installation guide for Ansible Navigator in the description as well. So it will walk you through whatever Linux variant you're using as well as Windows and Mac OS. So this is basically just setting up so it knows to appropriately leverage Ansible Navigator from the command line. So now I have actually everything set up that I need in order to leverage Ansible Navigator as well as that server. So I can actually go in and I will jump in from here. So I'll go to ansible.shadowman.dev and you'll notice it will now pull up that code server and I'm off and running. So I have a code server available to me and I can also install the Ansible extension that I talk about quite a bit. So I can just search for Ansible and here is that Ansible extension. I do already have you know a set of uh, settings that I like to use. So I'm just going to copy and paste that into the settings. Personally, I like the dark themes just because it makes things easier. So I'm just going to copy and paste and you'll notice it switches over to the dark theme. But now I'll have Ansible stood up and ready to go from the extension standpoint. You can leverage pre-releases if you want. That's all up to you. But now I've got Ansible extension installed and ready to go. So as I go through this process, and start writing playbooks, I can get some of that syntax highlighting capability and all that. So, you know, I'm just gonna leverage and open a folder for me and 
and maybe I just want to create a brand new um, YAML file. In this case, I trust it because I'm writing all these files. And this I can just do a, you know, hello.yaml. And then I can start creating some of this capability. So obviously I have not properly set up um, anything here. So you'll see a bunch of errors. What you should do instead is actually go into the extension settings. So extension settings, and this is where I can set up Ansible to use all those individual pieces that I want. So I want to use fully qualified collection names. I actually want to use uh, execution environment images. So I actually have one called controller. That's a lot smaller. So I'll leverage that one instead. And then this is where you can set the pull policy and all those different pieces, but conveniently I haven't logged in. So I can actually do this directly from the terminal. Uh, personally, I, you know, you can leverage bash. You have all kinds of options as you do this. So just let you know as you do that, but I can do, you know, a podman login tower ph dot shadow man dot dev. Um, and I do have my username already set up in this case on my container registry. So now if I try to pull, it actually would have the access to pull from this particular server. So I've got a, again, a very basic hello world type playbook and I'll paste that in here. In this case, I'll deny it. but you can see it's actually going through the process of, you know, pulling my Ansible execution environment image. And I'll even make this a little bit bigger so you can see as this process is going, but it will pull that execution environment in here so I can do actually all of my playbook development through VS code. So I don't have to worry about going back and forth through different pieces. You know, I even have Ansible Lint set up. So it's going to do that full development lifecycle through this VS Code editor running on my Ansible development server. So I can do everything from here without needing to go back and forth and do that testing. And then I can set this up to also point directly to a GitHub repository and all those pieces. So I can see the syntax highlighting already exists, which means this is properly set up. So everything is actually ready to go as I go through this process. So very easy without getting too detailed in terms of what I'm doing, but I would say I can shift between different versions of um, Ansible Navigator or different versions of execution environments. Again, I started with a very simple one, um, but I can start off with really anything that's either available in Quay or execution environments that you've created to get this process starting. So I wanna go back to my Ansible development server and say, well, maybe I you know, wanna start developing playbooks or maybe I just wanna do it from here. So I have this, uh, you know, hello.yaml. Maybe I wanna just have a new terminal window. And as you can see, I have that hello.yaml. Maybe I just wanna see, you know, Ansible Navigator. So I'm logged in again as this user. Uh, it will pull in this case because I don't have Ansible Navigator set up with uh, Ansible Navigator.yaml. It will pull the default image that's set, which is Ansible Navigator Demo EE. So I can actually just you know, hide everything and make the, the terminal biggest. So I can see as it goes through this process, it will pull that directly from Quay. So again, if I don't have an execution environment image, I can leverage that. But this will pull up the text user interface for Ansible Navigator once the uh, Podman pull is complete. And this is where I can start seeing what's available to me from this particular execution environment and actually run playbooks as well. So I'll do that in a second as we go through this process. So again, very easy to go through this. I don't have to worry about individual bits and pieces, but now I'm inside Ansible Navigator. I can navigate around at just like a normal terminal window. So I can jump into collections. It will show me the collections that are available in that um, demo execution environments. I can dive in, see all the different documentation, really everything that I may need to run to know kind of what's available to me from this particular execution environment. So again, very easy to do. The only thing I'm missing now is I don't have an inventory. So I'll jump back in here and just create a very basic inventory. And I'm just gonna run on this particular server, you know, just doing connection local. So as you can see, you know, very simple, not, not trying to get too complicated with this, but that's all set up and I can jump back into uh, my terminal window. Actually, I don't need all of these. So I can just jump back in here. And now maybe I don't wanna jump into and see what's going on. I actually just wanna run a playbook um, directly from the terminal. I don't want to actually dive into the depths of, you know, Ansible Navigator and that text user interface. So I can just do Ansible Nav Navigator run that hello playbook and I want to pass in my inventory. So this will open up in that text user interface and run the playbook. So again, this gives me the option to dive in so I can hit zero and see what's going on in the playbook. In this case, I had two tasks, gather facts, which is by default and then debug because that's what I had for hello. So I can jump in and hit zero and see what gather facts gathered. I can hit escape and then hit one. 
and then it gives me all the information for the actual debug command, which in my case was just printing out hello. So I can go back. And again, if I'd rather run this in a normal standard out mode, I can either change the Ansible navigator.yaml or I can just add in standard out mode. So this will actually run in standard out mode, which means you'll get your usual output that you used to if you've ever run Ansible playbook from the command line. So exactly what you'd expect from that side. So very simple, very straightforward. Um, now I can maybe add in some defaults. So if I do want to set up an Ansible navigator.yaml to say, here's my default execution environment. So instead of leveraging that uh, demo EE that I created, I actually want to create a new Ansible navigator.yaml, which is what Ansible navigator by default will look for. So I can paste in there a just very basic uh, file that will say, you know, here's what my settings are as I go through this process. So it doesn't need to be complicated. I can just set here, as you can see, Ansible Navigator. In this case, I want my execution environment. Again, in the description, it will have all of the information that I can place into the Ansible Navigator.yaml. This makes it very simple. So I can say, all right, here's the image that I want to leverage. I can set Podman versus Docker. I can set what's, where do I pull into if I actually run all these different pieces. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility to set up your environment. So anytime I run a playbook or jump into Ansible Navigator, I can jump into exactly where I want. So if you notice, this is now set as my image, which now if I actually run Ansible Navigator and you know just log in basically, you'll notice I get something actually very different than what I had before. So A, it's gonna pull in that execution environment if it doesn't exist, but when I go into collections, now it'll actually pull in that execution environment rather than the one that I had, um, which was that demo execution environment. So again, this gives you a lot of capability as I'm looking into really doing everything from, in this case, a web browser. I don't have to SSH into any host. I can do this all directly from here because I set this up as myself. So when I did that um, system CTL enable, I set it up as me. So now when I jump into the terminal, it auto logs in as me. I've got uh, ex root level privileges that I can escalate to. So I've got full capability to do this. So now all I have to do is maybe there are additional collections I want. I can leverage Ansible Builder to build up those collections. So now I have full capability to do start to finish without having to worry about how do I get access to Ansible content, Ansible playbooks, everything now can be run through my web browser for Ansible Navigator through this particular environment. So now that I've seen you know, the ability to stand up a server from scratch all the way through creating a VS Code server, you can or cannot do that, that's up to you. But then you can also leverage any sort of uh, command line to stand up Podman or Docker, and then make sure everything's pulled down with Ansible Navigator to run. So it does not have to be incredibly complicated to get this off and running. But again, I highly recommend leveraging VS Code and Ansible Navigator to simplify the development process because then you get that syntax highlighting and autocomplete, and then my Ansible development environment becomes portable. So where can you go next? You can check out a blog that walks through what is Ansible Navigator as well as the documentation. That documentation will tell you how to install Ansible Navigator, whether it's Linux, Windows, Mac. I've got that blog that walks through why can't rootless Podman pull my image. Again, I ran into this, so that's why I had to edit that um, sub UID and sub GUID file in order to give me access. And then also I've got the link for that VS Code server uh, in GitHub. So personally, I have mine generally running on my laptop, but this could help you set up a development server for multiple users to have access to it. So this, again, extends out that capability for users to do exactly what they need. So I hope you appreciate the time to learn a little bit more about how I can stand up an Ansible server. Um, please take the time to start getting comfortable with Ansible. Honestly, the easiest way to do it is get hands-on time and start building out that capability. Thank you.